Cray is the leader of the world's strongest clan, the Grieving Soul, and he is widely respected for his wisdom and power, but in reality, he is a total weakling, and just wants to find a way to quit his job. We see Cry standing in line at a Treasure Hunter clan meeting, and he looks like he really doesn't want to be here, but he's got no choice. Treasure hunters in this world are basically celebrities because they explore treasure vaults all over the world and risk their against phantoms, all with no health insurance. It's a dangerous job, but the promise of fame and riches compels dozens of people to become treasure hunters every year, and to that end, they often join a clan like First Steps, which is widely renowned in the capital as one of the best ever exist. It consists of a collection of parties that come together to assist one another, and the reason there are so many people here to join is because unless your name is Jin Wu, there's a limit to how far you can get as a solo hunter. Craig was trying to get this over with without drawing much attention to himself, but out of nowhere, the girl behind him starts talking and asks if he is here to join a party as well. Cry tries to use the age-old tactic of ignoring her until she goes away, but before he knows it, she has already walked in front of him and is introducing herself. Her name is Ruda and she's a level 3 hunter, so she extends a hand to Cry, but he refuses to shake hands with her, although he does give her his name. Ruda is disappointed that Cray didn't shake her hand, but she gets over it and starts talking about herself some more. She has been solo hunting until now, but she came across a vault called the White Wolf Den, and she couldn't handle it on her own. So she wanted to come to join a party. Just then, the man in front of them turns around and tells Ruda she should be trying to take on vaults as dangerous as the White Wolf Den, while she's still only level 3. He smirks and calls her an inexperienced amateur, because even if she's level 3, she is still basically a beginner compared to the other professional hunters out there. As the argument gets more heated, Ruda becomes really angry, and Cry really wishes he had stayed home so he wouldn't have gotten involved with them. Ruda pulls out her knives and is about to attack the man, but before she does anything, a guard comes over and reminds Ruda that these aren't the streets of London, so if she keeps this up, she's going to be banned from the clan meeting. She realizes she lost her temper for a moment, so she puts her knives away and apologizes for the outburst, all while Cray tries to act like he's not here. A little while later, Cray makes it into the clan meeting and Ruda is still with him because he's the only person she knows here. She is amazed by all the powerful hunters here and honestly feels a little overwhelmed since she has never been to a place like this before. She asks Cray if he has been here before, so he tells her that this is his fifth time here and Ruda thinks he must suck at being a hunter if he has to keep coming back to the recruitment meeting. Among hunters, talent is everything, so even a random nobody can make a name for themselves and climb through the ranks. Ruda notices a party in flashy attire on the other side of the room, so she asks Cry about it, and he informs her that the party is called Ark Brave, and of all the parties recruiting today, they are undeniably the strongest. As a group, they once managed to complete a level 7 vault with just 6 members, so they are widely respected. And if you get scouted by their leader, Ark Rodin, you are pretty much guaranteed to have a good hunter career, although he is pretty picky with his selection criteria. Ruda is intrigued to learn more, so she asks about the empty desk over in the corner of the room, but before Cry can say anything, the guy from before comes over and tells her he will explain everything. Ruda doesn't really want his help after the argument they had outside, but Greg goes on to explain anyway, and tells her that the desk belongs to the party that founded this clan, the Grievers. The party was a group of talented youngsters who arrived in the capital a few years ago and made a name for themselves as the Grieving Souls, but what the others don't know is that the legendary party consists of Cray's childhood friends. Apparently, there were rumors floating around that the Grieving Soul party would be recruiting today, but since their spot is empty, Greg assumes the rumors were false. Just then, a kid who came here hoping to apply to the Grieving Souls party noticed that they aren't here yet, so he becomes irate because he believes he is going to become the strongest hunter in the world someday, so the only party worth joining is the Grieving Souls. Greg finds the kid amusing, but Ruda doesn't have the guts to say anything since the kid actually has a higher level than her. Just then, a girl named Tino steps up and is prepared to shut the red-haired kid up with violence, because she's the only one who deserves to join the Grieving Souls party. Her partner tries calming her down since this isn't worth causing a scene, even if the red-haired guy was being really annoying. For a second, it looked like they had calmed down enough to avoid a fight, but then Greg joins in with his first-class instigation, and all of a sudden, the entire room is supporting the fight. All gloves are off now, so Tino and the kids square up to face each other. Cry can tell things are going to get hectic real soon, and he doesn't want to be around when that happens, so he asks Ruda to come outside with him. As the fight is about to start, Tino already intends to kill the kid over what was essentially bragging, and she'll just call Saul later to handle the murder charges. 
Or at least that was the plan until she sensed a familiar presence nearby, and the second she spots Cray, she forgets all about the fight and charges straight for him. Cry is caught off guard by the sudden attack, so he stumbles backwards and Tino nervously turns, calling him master and asking if he saw her lose her temper over there. Ark then comes over as well and greets Cray, since he has been waiting for his arrival. They wouldn't have been able to start the clan meeting until Cry arrived anyway since he is both the clan master and the leader of Grieving Souls. Everyone who didn't already recognize him is shocked to hear this because that means Cry must be the most important person here, however, all the attention he's getting is making him feel sick so he really just wants to go home. Several years ago, when Cray and his childhood friends first arrived in the capital, they were clearing all the beginner vaults in record time, but there was just one problem, Cray had no idea what he was doing. He got saved from a monster, and his teammates thought he was intentionally lowering his guard so he could act as bait, and he goes with it, but he was totally about to get chomped. They all shared the same dream to become exceptional hunters, but unlike the other five, Cray was exceptionally ordinary. He knew that sooner or later, he would become nothing but a burden to the party and he didn't want his friends to resent him for his weakness, so he made the decision to leave the party on his own. However, when he tried to quit, it somehow ended up with him being appointed as the leader of the party. That's how he got to his current position as the leader of his truly gifted childhood friends, but he really wishes he could just retire from being a hunter. Ruda and Greg still can't believe they were talking to the clan master the entire time, and while Cray is in his chair, Ark comes over and asks if Cry showed up late because he wanted to observe the crowd as one of the common folk. Cry denies this and says he just overslept, but Ark isn't listening and firmly believes that Cray showed up late on purpose. For some reason, no matter how much Cray tries to explain himself, people always misunderstand him in a way that makes him look better than he actually is. Kinev doesn't like how close Ark is with Cray, so she wants to have him kicked out of the clan, but Cray isn't going to do that. Tino is a level 4 hunter who also happens to be an apprentice to one of Kay's childhood friends, Liz, so she hangs around him a lot. Ark asks Cray if he has any good candidates in mind for recruitment, but there honestly isn't a need to add any new members to the clan right now. Although, since Ark almost never actually recruits new members, Cray takes the opportunity and asks if Ark will seriously consider any recommendations he makes. Ark says he will accept anyone Cray chooses, and this is a huge surprise to everyone, so the vice captain tries to talk him out of such a rash decision. However, Ark cuts her off and says anyone Cray chooses will be worthy of joining his party. Tiana begins blushing because she thinks Ark is thinking about recommending her, but she also doesn't like Ark, so she's a bit conflicted about whether to accept or not. All of a sudden, the kid from earlier whose name is Gilbert, by the way, comes out to the front of the crowd, and he is totally ready to beg if that's what it takes to be accepted by Cray. Cry tries thinking about whether Gilbert would be a good choice or not, but he quickly gives up because he is a terrible judge of character. He has no idea how to tell if someone will become strong in the future, so he decides to leave it up to pure luck. He tells Gilbert that he is willing to recommend him, but he has one condition before that. As a hunter, the most important thing is to make sure you always win. If he lacks strength, he will end up putting his party members in danger, so Cry wants him to demonstrate that he has the ability to always win. Also, since Cray began his career as a hunter, he has never lost before, although that's because he has never actually been in a real fight. Anyway, Cray takes off one of his ring artifacts and announces to every hunter here that the first person to present this ring to Ark will be accepted into his party, and with that he tosses the ring into the wild to watch the chaos unfold. The first one to get the ring is Gilbert, but that doesn't last long because not even a second later, Tino jumps down at him and mees his face so hard that he gets sent all the way across the room. Gilbert probably needs a doctor now, but no one's focused on him right now because the ring is currently rolling across the floor, and while everyone is initially hesitant to act, it doesn't take long before they all start fighting over it. At this point, Cray decides to take his leave, and even though the bar is getting destroyed as he leaves, he says it's not his problem and goes home. However, the next morning it became his problem as the bar fight made front page news. Apparently, the entire place was leveled because of the fight, but luckily there were no civilian casualties at the end of the day. However, as a result of the events, Eva tells him that the Explorers Association wants to have a private meeting with him, and Cry already knows that means they are going to yell at him. He asks how Ark took the news and Eva tells him that Ark actually took it pretty well and laughed it off. Since Ark probably isn't mad, Cry wants to take advantage of his good mood and send him the bill to rebuild the bar as well as ask him to go handle to meeting with the Association, but Eva informs him that the meeting is specifically meant for him, so there's no way he's getting out of it this time. Even if he tries ignoring it, the association manager, Gark is just going to hunt him down like he always does, so Cry caves in and agrees to go, but he will be using his secret weapon to get it over as soon as possible. And that secret weapon is to grovel and apologize. 
He also argues that the only damage was to the bar and since no one was hurt, and the bar owner has been compensated to cover the repairs of the bar, there shouldn't be any further issues. Gark hasn't even gotten a chance to yell at Cry yet, but after seeing Cry apologize, he just lets it go for now. However, even if there aren't any official complaints against him, he still needs to take responsibility for his actions, which is why Gark is assigning him a quest, and he has no right to refuse. The association gets all kinds of quests for hunters, but with such a large volume, there are bound to be quests that are so difficult or pay so little that no one wants to do them. These quests are what the hunters call chores, and Cray really doesn't want to have to deal with one of those, so he tries putting on an act and saying he is too important to be stuck with a chore, however, Gark isn't letting him get out of this, so he is forced to pick one. Cry opens the quest book and starts looking through it for the easiest quest, and of everything available, the lowest level is 3, so he picks that one. He was planning on just dumping the work on Ark, but when he goes to look for him, he is informed by Tino that Ark is currently away on a meeting with some nobles. He's going to be gone for a while and no one else is here, so he doesn't have many options to ditch his work. Just then, he notices that Tino is wearing his ring, meaning she was the one who won his little game yesterday, but that aside, he asks her if she is free at the moment. Tino is excited because she thinks he wants to ask her out on a date, but to her dismay, he tells her he has a quest for her. She immediately runs away, but even though she's fast, Cry has his ways of catching up to her. He summons his chained dog, Silver, and instructs it to capture Tino, and before long, Cry has her tied up in a chair so he can discuss the quest with her. She feels betrayed because she just wanted to go on a date with Cray, but now he's forcing her to go on this crappy quest all by herself. Cry asks if the problem is that she doesn't want to do it alone, and Tino responds that she wouldn't be opposed to the idea if Cry would join her, however, that would mean Cry would have to do actual work, so he instead opts to send Tino on the mission with a bunch of the hunters he met yesterday. Six years ago, when Cray's party first arrived at the capital, they were about to walk into the association to officially register as hunters, but Cray started having second thoughts as soon as they got to the door. Luke told him to stop worrying about it so much since he was the one who suggested that they should aim to become the best in the capital. But Cray isn't worried about his friend's strength. He is worried because he knows he will only drive them down. Luke told him to stop saying such silly things and took it upon himself to open the doors of the association and declare that he is the strongest swordsman in the world, followed by Liz who declared that she was the strongest thief in the world. There's no turning back after such a grandiose entrance, so Cry walks up to the reception desk to register his party, but he wants to make them regret selecting him as their leader, so when he is asked to pick a name for his party, he decides to pick something edgy and calls the party Grieving Soul for no reason. The others in the party thought the name was too dark and gloomy, but when Cray tries to use his bad naming sense as an excuse to quit being the leader, they all change their tune and say they love the name. Back to the present, Cry calls a meeting with all the people he wants to offload his work onto and Greg still can't believe Cry is really the guild master of the Grievers. As hard as it may be to believe, Cry confirms his position, meaning he is also the infamous thousand tricks that everyone has heard about. In the association, when a hunter achieves a certain level of accomplishment and prestige, they are given special names and basically become celebrities. Cry ended up being with Thousand Tricks as his second name, but Gilbert refuses to believe that Cry is telling the truth because Thousand Tricks is meant to be the strongest person in the capital, and Cry looks like he never even trains. Tino immediately begins defending Cry and says Gilbert is the one who is too weak to comprehend Cray's power, although Cry has no idea what power she's talking about because he is only called the strongest thanks to his friends constantly giving him undue praise. That aside, Cry asks if Gilbert and the others want to accept the job, but Gilbert refuses to accept a request from Cray, because he still doesn't believe that Cray is the strongest in the city. Greg tries to stop Gilbert from talking because who knows what could happen if the strongest person in the capital gets angry, but Gilbert doesn't care and shoves his fingers up Greg's nose. Since Gilbert seems like he doesn't want to take part, Cry simply gives up on trying to convince him and moves on to Greg. Greg is more than happy to accept Cray's request, so the only one left is Ruda. Since the quest is going to be in a wolf den, Cray thought this would be perfect for her since she was already trying to clear it. Ruda isn't exactly thrilled with her teammate selection, but she says she will go along with it. Cry is pleased to hear that, so he tells Tino that if she needs more help, she can ask someone else from the clan to go with her. Tino pleads with Cry to join the team as well, but he immediately refuses. Now that he has settled the matter of Tino's party, Cry turns around to leave, but Gilbert doesn't like the fact that Cry is ignoring him. So he decides to challenge Cry to a duel, and if he loses, he will join the team. Cry hates it when people challenge him, so he comes up with a simple solution and agrees to the duel, but under the condition that Tino will fight in his place. 
Tina was fine with the arrangement because she is majorly pissed at Gilbert for daring to insult and question her master. But she also uses the opportunity to show Cried just how flexible she can be with superb camera angles. Gilbert may have gotten his face caved in by Tino yesterday, but he says he was just caught off guard and that he won't be losing to her a second time. And once he has beaten Tino, he will come for Cry next. Cry is starting to get annoyed and has no intention of fighting for any reason today, but since Gilbert seems so confident, Cry informs him that Tino is level 4 just like him. Tino adds to this by saying there's no way she could ever lose to someone like him and to assert her dominance, she drops her weapons on the ground. Ruta and Greg are starting to get worried because even if Tino is stronger, fighting without weapons would put her at a serious disadvantage. Under normal circumstances, Tino would win this fight because even though both of them are on the same level, Tino gained all her levels on solo missions. And she has a lot of experience fighting humans, so she should be able to win even without her weapon. But Gilbert possessed the Purgatorial Flame Sword, and that is enough of a wild card to tip the scales in his favor if he uses it right. Or it would have been if he hadn't thrown his sword down and decided to fight barehanded as well. That was without a doubt a dumb move, but Gilbert refuses to be looked down on. So he wants to fight on equal terms as Tino. Tino now knows for sure that she can win, so she says she wants to go get ice cream with Cry after she has beaten Gilbert up. And as the match starts, she charges in and strikes at Gilbert's face. He manages to dodge the first strike, but he still gets hit with a kick to the face that sends him flying just like last time. It looks like the fight is already over, but to his credit, Gilbert gets back up and charges back in to continue fighting. He doesn't do much and gets caught in chokehold immediately, but at least he's got spirit. Though he had to strain himself to do so, Gilbert is eventually able to break free from Tino's hold. However, he immediately gets knocked to the ground by a chop to the back of the head. He's definitely not getting back up this time, so Tino begins celebrating and thanks Cray for helping her become so strong, although Cray never actually did anything to train her. Greg and Ruta are left in utter disbelief at the fact that Tino is so strong and Gilbert can't face the reality that there's someone stronger than him. Ever since the day he first picked up a sword, Gilbert knew that he was destined to become a hunter. As he trained, he found himself surpassing the skill levels of professional swordsmen with ease, and when he finally became old enough to register as a hunter, he came to the capital and formed a small party to begin clearing vaults. Up till now, he had never tasted defeat, but even though she doesn't like him, Tino can appreciate that Gilbert is a strong swordsman, so she encourages him to pick up his sword if he wants to keep fighting. Gilbert refuses because of his pride and Tino is disappointed because foolish pride like that will only end up getting you killed. As much as Gilbert hates to admit, Tino is right, and if this had been a real fight, he would have been killed several times over by now. He has to face the reality that he isn't as strong as he thought he was, but just then. Cry calls over to him and guesses that Gilbert must have quit his former party because of a difference in strength. Gilbert is shocked because Cry is totally right and Cry explains that a similar issue arose in his party, although he didn't leave because of it even if he may have wanted to. Gilbert misunderstands this to mean that Cry greatly outclasses all of his teammates in Grieving Soul, the strongest party in the capital, and that gives him a whole new perspective on what it means to be the strongest. Cry then notices Gilbert's sword and gives it a light tap to see what it can do. Flames begin pouring out of it at Cray's command, and Gilbert is astonished because in all the time he has possessed the sword, he has never managed to draw out flames as large as Cray, much less control it to this extent. And Cray didn't even have to grab the sword by the handle to do it. In this world, mana material is a coarse substance, and while it is everywhere, it can't be seen with the naked eye. However, within treasure vaults, mana material is condensed into all sorts of physical forms, although there is still a lot about it that isn't understood. The White Wolf's Den is one of these treasure vaults, and it is said that wolf phantoms soaked in blood spawn within it, so Cray is glad he sent the others and didn't have to go down there himself. Eva asks him if he's sure it was a good idea to send inexperienced hunters into the Wolf's Den, but he believes it should be fine since the Den is only level 3, and the four of them are pretty skilled. Also, he wants to thank Eva for the information she gave him on Gilbert, because it was really funny to see his reaction when Cry randomly guessed a bunch of stuff about his past. She's glad she could be of service, but she also heard about the way Cry used Gilbert's relic so effortlessly, and she wants to know how he did it. Cry explains that the relic was a straightforward one that kind Cry is able to control immediately. Even Gilbert, as inexperienced as he is, was able to use it without much training, so Cray doesn't think what he did was all that impressive. Still, there's nothing Cray loves more than collecting relics, so he is seriously considering asking Gilbert to sell him the sword, 
but Ava immediately shuts that down because Cry keeps spending a ton of his budget on relic collecting. His collection is already massive, so she doesn't understand why he would even want another one in the first place. Cry explains that each relic is unique in its own way, so even if he has over 20 relic rings alone, he could always use more. Ava realizes she isn't getting through to him, but even if he does have a considerable income, she can't have him blowing it all on relics. All the profits of the Grieving Soul Party are split evenly among members regardless of contributions, so despite the fact that Cray barely ever does anything, he still gets a fat paycheck at the end of the month. Cry doesn't want to give up his relic collecting though, so when he notices that one of his relics needs to be charged, he uses it as an excuse to leave the conversation. He goes to a member of the association and asks for a little help charging his relic up with magic, and they are happy to help since Cry is always doing so much for them. While Cray's relic is being charged, the guy tells Cray about a rogue phantom that appeared on the road up north and destroyed a caravan. There were three level 3 hunters guarding the caravan, so the phantom must be a strong one and the Third Order Knights are now recruiting for an extermination party. The reports say the Phantom was a wolf, and the location isn't far from the White Wolf Den, so it must have come from there. There was probably a mass spawning of wolves, so that must mean the Den is absolutely crawling with enemies as they speak, and anyone unlucky enough to be down there is going to have a bad time. Cry tries to dissuade his worries and thinks to himself that Tino's party is probably fine, but then the people he is sitting with start talking about how the monsters in the White Wolf Den have been growing a lot stronger recently, so the association has been thinking of raising the threat level on it. In fact, a level 5 Lancer's party ended up going missing in that vault, so there's no way anyone less than level 5 could handle it. Cry is definitely worried now and decides to take a look at the quest he received earlier, only now realizing that he was supposed to rescue said level 5 Lancer and his party. He really should have read the details of the quest before sending Tino and the others down there, but it's too late to call them back now. The others at the table see Cry acting strange, so they ask him if something is wrong and he tells them he actually sent Tino down into the White Wolf Den. The two are horrified that Cry sent Tino, who was only level 4 down into a vault that a level 5 party couldn't beat. Esu must have known how dangerous it was and sent her down there as part of her training because what kind of irresponsible teacher would send his student on a deadly mission like this without researching it first? Cry suddenly gets up and says there's something urgent he needs to attend to. Once he gets into the halls, he starts having a panic attack and tries to rationalize it, saying Tino is quite skilled, so she may be able to handle this and Gilbert is almost equal in strength to her, as long as he is using his flame sword. However, Cry remembers that he used up all the power in the sword back when he was doing his demonstration, so if Gilbert didn't recharge it afterwards, that sword is basically useless. While Tino and the others are approaching the White Wolf Den, they begin to sense a dangerous aura even though they haven't gotten to the den yet. Tino was expecting something like this to happen since Cray was the one who sent her out on this mission, which is why she wrote a will in case she ends up dying. Although she is sure that she won't die because this has all been perfectly calculated by Cray. She believes the fact that Cray chose them to join her on this mission must have also been carefully deliberated, but Greg doesn't think that's possible since Cray only met them yesterday. Gilbert agrees that it's improbable, but he wouldn't put it past Cray to be able to do research on all of them before they had even met. In fact, the whole incident at the pub was probably part of his plan as well, so while this mission may be way above their lead, Tino is sure Cry wouldn't randomly send them on a mission they have no hope of surviving. Unfortunately, that's exactly what Cry did, and he's freaking out over it. He decides to go and rescue them himself, so he goes into his hidden room and starts grabbing all the relics he can carry. As he is leaving, Ava spots him and she too assumes Cry intentionally sent Tino on that dangerous mission just to test her, and while he obliviously planned it so she wouldn't be in danger of dying, he must still be slightly worried so he is going to check up on them. She even notices that Cry is carrying Shitori's slime relic, which is technically against imperial law to possess, but he doesn't know what he's going to be facing, so he wants to be prepared. He heads out onto the balcony and equips a wingsuit relic, so he can get to the White Wolf Den as quickly as possible. And as he leaves, Eva hopes he can make it back alright, because the last person who used that wingsuit died after crashing headfirst into a wall. After a long and arduous battle, Tino and the others finally manage to defeat the wolf and Greg is relieved they managed to take it down, but Tino isn't happy with the way the team performed in that battle. There was only one wolf, so they had the numbers advantage yet they still struggled so much to take it down. Speaking of which, Greg asks Gilbert why he didn't use his sword fire since it would have made the fight a lot easier, but that's when Gilbert tells them that his sword is actually out of mana, which is weird since he could have sworn he had it charge a couple days ago. He then realizes that Cray's stunt must have discharged the relic, and he isn't able to charge it out here, it's basically just a regular sword now. 
Ruta thinks it might be better to turn back now since this mission is already far more dangerous than they were informed it would be. In fact, under these circumstances, Greg is pretty sure that the people they are supposed to be rescuing would have died by now. So there would be no point in continuing, however, Tino speaks up and tells everyone that they are going to stick to the plan no matter what. Greg tries to argue that their survival is more important than a corpse retrieval mission, but Tino corrects him because she knows for a fact that this isn't a corpse retrieval mission. She is sure that the rescue targets are still alive inside the vault because Cry is the one who sent her on this mission and he is never wrong. In fact, draining the mana from Gilbert's sword must have also been done intentionally because he doesn't want them to rely on relics too much. The others are convinced, so they decide to follow her lead and continue with the mission. But once they get to the wolf den, they discover that all the wolves are fully equipped with armor and weapons, so defeating a large number like this is going to be hard. Gilbert volunteers to go out first and try to take out some of the wolves, but Tino calls him an idiot because he would get shot before he ever got close enough. She is the leader of this team, and as such, it is her duty to make sure that everyone on her team makes it back alive, so since she and Ruta are nimble, she says they will run out first and draw the wolves' fire, at which point Greg and Gilbert will attack from behind. The ranged weapons shouldn't be much of a threat once they get close to them, but even if things get out of hand, she refuses to use anyone as a sacrifice. Meanwhile, Cry is currently flying to the wolf den, and he really hopes Tino manages to survive somehow, even if she has to sacrifice everyone else to do it. Thankfully, Tino isn't around to hear him say that, so she continues fighting with the others to ensure the team's survival. Thanks to the fact they've been working together, the team has managed to handle the monsters they have come across so far, although it hasn't been easy. The main reason they have been able to defeat the wolves like this is because the wolves have no sense of teamwork, so as even more approach the team, Gilbert and Greg are confident that they can cut them down. Tino acknowledges that even though this is their first time working together, this makeshift team works surprisingly well. She may not like Gilbert's personality, but he is a strong fighter when he uses his sword, and Greg has a lot of experience, so he coordinates well with him. As for Ruda, she isn't able to help much in terms of combat, but since both she and Tino are thief class, Ruda is able to handle all the recon, which allows Tino to focus on combat. She believes that every little detail of the structure of this team must have been carefully thought out by Cray, so she begins praying to him as some sort of god. Meanwhile, as Gilbert is fighting a wolf in the back, he has a flashback to the last time he spoke to his former party members. He had just lashed out at them because they weren't pulling their weight. His teammates apologized and said they just couldn't keep up with him, so he decided to quit and go off on his own. Deep down, he knew his former teammates were trying their best, but the gap in strength between him and them just kept growing, so he could no longer stay with them. After that, he exclusively hunted solo, but now he knows how good it can feel to work side by side with someone. Gilbert and Greg manage to take down the last wolf in this section, so the team moves on until they come across a wide open area. They are about to head in, but all of a sudden, Tino tells everyone to wait because she can sense something else in the room. The others ask if it might be the hunters that they are meant to be rescuing, but from what Tino can tell, the vault boss is up ahead. Greg thinks fighting the boss is too big of a risk to take, so he suggests that they all run away for now, but Tino points out that they've managed to make it this far already without suffering any injuries, so a single vault boss shouldn't be too hard to beat. She tells Greg that he could stand to be a little more courageous because playing it safe all the time won't help him grow. Greg admits that he had grown complacent with his level of strength, because it's possible to make a decent living as a level 4 hunter. Before he even realized it, he had begun to run away at the slightest sign of a challenge, and his cowardly inclination was no doubt caused by witnessing all his friends die due to foolish bravery. No one would fault Greg for living the safe and easy hunter life, but the fact that he approached the First Steps clan is proof that Greg wants to continue to grow, and Cray must have realized that, which is why he put him on this team. Greg doesn't believe Cry could have put this much thought into placing him on the team, but what other explanation could there be, because there's no way Cry randomly chose him because he was nearby at the time. Ruta asks if there's some special reason Cray had for choosing her as well, but the only remarkable thing Tino can say about Ruta is that she has big milkers. Meanwhile, Cry is flying around the forest near the wolf den, and he was hoping Tino and the others would flee from the vault once they realized it was a lot more dangerous than expected, but unfortunately, he hasn't been able to spot them yet, so he has to go check the den now. And there are no brakes on the wingsuit, so he ends up crashing his way through the wolf den's tunnels. Meanwhile, Tino and the others have just come across the dungeon boss, and it's a lot bigger than what they were expecting. As the boss makes the first move, the team is forced to split up and start running around the room to evade it. But even without directly engaging with it, they can tell that this thing is insanely strong, so even Tino is starting to question if they can handle it. 
Just then, she spots a weak point on the wolf's head, and she reminds herself that there's no way Cray would send her on a mission that he didn't think she could complete, so she can't let herself give up. She yells over to Gilbert and asks him to block one of the wolf's attacks for her, after which she'll handle the rest. Gilbert agrees, so as the wolf closes in on them, he charges forward to draw its attention, so as the wolf strikes at him, he blocks the attack with his sword. And while he thinks the wolf is totally defenseless, Greg rushes in to slash its legs, but unfortunately, he gets smacked away like a bug. The others seem to be doing pretty well though, since they can move around a lot quicker than he can. A few seconds later, Greg gets back up and tries to rejoin the fight, but the very next second, his sword gets slashed in half and the wolf tries to land a killing blow on him. Luckily, Ruta was able to get him out of the way in time, so the wolf missed him. And while the wolf's axe is stuck in the ground, Tina runs on top of it to get close to its head. The wolf attempts to stop her by clawing her leg, but Tina powers through the pain and stabs the wolf straight in the back of the neck. With that, the wolf monster has finally been defeated, so when Tino lands back on the ground, Ruta goes over to check on her since she was badly injured. Tino says she'll be alright because she has a healing potion on her, so she's able to mostly recover from the wound. Meanwhile, Greg is a little upset that his sword was broken, but he's still alive, so it isn't all bad. Now that they've successfully defeated the vault boss, the group thinks all they need to do is find the missing hunters and get back to town, so Tino hands Greg her sword to use in the meantime. But all of a sudden, a giant arrow was shot straight at Tino's chest, and although she managed to dodge it, the boss battle isn't over as four more bosses walk in with new loadouts. It took a lot of effort just to defeat one of them, so Tino isn't sure what they should do against four, and suggests that they all run into that narrow cave over there to create some separation from the wolves. That was a solid plan, but the wolves catch on to the plan as well, so one of them jumps in front of said cave and completely blocks off the entrance. Now there really aren't any other options, so Greg and Gilbert look at each other and make the difficult decision to stay behind and distract the wolves while Ruta and Tino escape. The two of them are the quickest on the team, so they have the best chance of survival in a situation like this, so the guys will buy them some time. Tino is still trying to figure out what to do, so she wonders what Cry would do in a situation like this, and all of a sudden, she remembers the ring she got from him. That gives her an idea, so she tells the others that no one will be sacrificing themselves today. She says she is going to charge at the first wolf, and when she does, she wants everyone to support her. Greg and Gilbert take the initiative and draw the wolf's attention while Ruta throws some kunai at its eye, and while it is temporarily blinded, Tino activates the shooting ring relic. With it, she is able to fire a laser beam straight into the wolf's eye, causing it to go blind in an instant. This is the perfect chance to attack, so Gilbert rushes ahead to deal the finishing blow, however, even though the wolf couldn't see, it was still able to sense him coming, so it knocked Gilbert away and into a wall. Tino runs over to check on him and Gilbert apologizes for getting himself hurt so badly, but Tino tells him he did nothing wrong because it was her plan's failure that led to this. They've run out of ideas at this point, so it looks like they really will meet their end in this vault. However, just before the wolf attacks, it gets knocked into the wall with incredible force. It turns out that Cry happened to crash land in the perfect spot, but he's so confused about what's going on that he doesn't notice when one of the wolves takes a swing at him. However, thanks to one of his many relics, he remains completely unharmed. That attack normally would have killed him, but he brought a ton of protection rings with him, so he basically has 17 lives on him. He then points at the wolf and activates all of his shooting rings at full power, sending a powerful blast at the wolf and knocking it away. Everyone is really impressed by Cray's power, but he hadn't even intended to attack in the first place, he just freaked out when he saw the wolf acted on instinct. Unfortunately, despite the powerful blast, the wolf gets back up again, although Cry had expected this since he knows the damage output of the shooting rings is pretty low. He is once again surrounded, and he's really glad he brought so many protection rings with him, but if he's going to get out of this, he's going to have to use the forbidden slime. He takes it off his necklace and inspects it a little before throwing it into the crowd of wolves and telling everyone to start running away. Tino's leg is still slightly injured from earlier, so she isn't able to run as fast as usual, so Cray runs slower to guard everyone's back. Or at least that's what everyone thinks, but it turns out Cry is actually just really slow compared to them. While running, Tino gets a flashback to the first day she met Cray, which was when his party saved her from being sold off as a slave by some street thugs. Ever since that day, Tino became infatuated with Cray and would constantly seek his approval, which is why once they have gotten to safety, she is nervously waiting to see what Cray says since she wasn't able to complete the mission. Before Cry says anything, Ruta speaks up and says even if she wasn't able to defeat the bosses, she still did amazing as a leader and Cray agrees that she did well, mostly because he expected them all to be dead by now, that she kept them alive. Tino was really happy to be praised, 
But then Cry notices the wound left on her leg, so he uses one of his healing relics to get her back to full strength. Greg asks if Cry is going to defeat the bosses, but he says that isn't the best option given the circumstances, so he tells them all to just follow him. Right now, Cry doesn't even care about the rescue mission anymore and just wants to leave, but he has no idea where the exit is, so he's just leading the group around in circles. Tino and Ruda are both thieves, so he really wishes they would do some recon or something, but they have complete faith that Cry knows where he is going even though he doesn't. Just then, Gilbert speaks up, and after all he has learned, he is sure the great Cray must know what he is doing, but to him it kind of looks like they are wandering around aimlessly. He asks if Cray is taking them to the exit, but before Cry can answer, Tino speaks up and tells him that this path doesn't lead to the exit. She has a rough idea of the layout of the den since she saw a map, so she knows they are heading in the opposite direction of the exit, and Cray must have his reasons for it. Ruta has total faith in him as well, but she wishes Cry would at least tell them where they are headed, but he keeps staying silent. Eventually, they come across a fork in the road, so Cry randomly guesses on a path to take, but as he turns, everyone else is left in shock, because Cry has just led them to the injured hunters they were sent here to rescue. Of course, Cry still has no idea what he's doing, but since everyone seems to be heading down the other path, he follows them, and when he sees them tending to the injured hunters, he is amazed that Tino noticed them because he sure as hell wouldn't have. The leader of the injured party is named Dave, and he thanks Tino for rescuing them. But Tino tells him that the one he should be thanking is Cray, because they never would have made it here without him. Cray tries telling them that he just guessed which direction to go, so he doesn't deserve any praise, but none of them believe that for a second and think he is just being modest. That aside, Ruda has given the injured hunters some potions to help them recover, but they are still losing a lot of energy since they haven't eaten in a long time. Just then, Cray thinks of the perfect solution because he just so happened to have brought a magic bag with him. He has a near infinite amount of chocolate inside, but the only thing the bag can store is chocolate, so it's pretty useless outside of this one scenario. Greg tells Dave that he's glad he's alright because when he had initially heard that a level 5 party went missing in this dungeon, he was worried something terrible had happened to them. Dave tells him that they just barely managed to survive and Gilbert finds that hard to believe because those wolves may have been strong, but there's no way a level 5 party would have been overwhelmed by monsters of that level. However, Dave wasn't talking about the wolves, rather he was talking about a small phantom covered in bones that single-handedly laid waste to their party. Whatever that thing is, it is the pure embodiment of a grudge. It has full control over the vault, so it is most likely the curse of the silver moon that dwells within this vault. It represents the grudge and resentment of all the monsters that were slain and because of the vault, it grew in strength, until it became an absolute monster. Dave and the rest of the party are considered to be top of the line when it comes to strength, yet every one of them was completely helpless against this beast, so much so that Dave would call the monster a rival to the Grieving Souls member, Thousand Swords. Thousand Swords is widely undisputably regarded as the strongest swordsman in the capital as he has studied all orthodox sword techniques and then he used those techniques to learn even more techniques. He is an unfathomable prodigy who can cut down enemies by the dozens, and all with a wooden sword too. Luke is not one to take lightly, so Cray thinks it's an exaggeration to say that a phantom is as strong as him. After all, if such a phantom really did exist, Luke would have hunted it down long ago, but given that the phantom completely decimated a level 5 party, Cray doesn't think Tino and her party will be able to win against it, so Gay's really wishing he had just dumped this job on Ark after all so he wouldn't have to deal with it. Dave goes on to say that the monster was basically playing with their lives so it didn't kill them immediately the last time they fought, but if they encounter it again, it will without a doubt finish them off. Ruta turns to Cry and asks him what they should do, but Cry is internally freaking out because he wasn't mentally prepared to deal with this. He stares blankly into space for a while before coming up with an idea and telling Ruta that they need to prioritize the safety of the injured, so they should escape the vault before doing anything else. On top of that, since this was originally Tino's mission, he tells her that she's in charge from here on out. Tino doesn't think she deserves to have the role of leader when someone as great as Cry is here, but Cry insists that she takes the lead because he doesn't want to do it. Tino ends up agreeing to act as the leader again, and she agrees with what Cry had said about escaping the vault, so she's going to lead everyone back to the exit. They should be able to make it there much quicker, since Cry completely healed her leg, but Cry tells her to remember that there are still injured people in the group, so she shouldn't run too fast for them to keep up. He mainly says this for his own benefit, because there's no way he could keep up with Tino's full speed when he's so out of shape. 
After traversing the vault for a bit, Tino tells everyone that they are getting close to the exit, and they've gotten lucky so far since they haven't encountered the deadly phantom. But if that thing does show up, Dave promises to act as everyone's shield to buy them some time to escape. Tino assures him that that won't be necessary because as long as Cry is with them, she is sure everyone will make it out alive. However, Cry has no confidence that everyone will make it out alive. In fact, he is seriously considering grabbing Tino and ditching the rest of them if that monster shows up after all, but for now, he decides to remain optimistic. He still has five safety rings, so he can at the very least survive for a little while if he really had to fight, but doesn't have any other useful relics with him. The shot rings don't work and he dropped the one sword relic he had while flying over here, so it's hard to be optimistic. Just then, everyone feels something approaching them, so they all get into battle stance and Kray stands in front of Tino to keep her safe. He doesn't have any attack relics with him, but he is willing to use his body as a human missile, the wingsuit, if it comes down to it. The aura of the cave shifts as the phantom begins approaching them. Everyone is terrified because they can already tell they stand no chance against that thing. However, Tino sees something even more terrifying appear behind the monster, and a sense of impending doom washes over her, so she starts begging Cry to help her. Cry seems to know who the second figure is, but he is more confused than scared since he has no idea why she is here. Just then, the second figure flash steps and takes out the phantom in one kick, and after that display of force, there's no doubt in Cray's mind that it's Liz. She then goes up to Cry, and just to make sure, she asks him if it's alright that she kicked that thing into the wall because she doesn't really know what's going on here. Cry tells her she has nothing to worry about and she's glad to hear that, and since she's finally gotten to Cray, she tells him she found one of his sword relics on the ground while she was on her way here. Ruta and Greg immediately realize who Liz is, but Dave has never heard of her, so Liz gets angry because she can't believe there are hunters who don't know about greeting souls. She was already having a bad day before she got here because she ran all the way home just to see Cray, but then she was told that Cray had gone out to this vault. At first of all, she thought Cry was just worrying too much because she was sure Tino could have handled the mission by herself. So imagine how disappointed she is to find out that Tino is incapable of handling such a minor vault by herself. Gilbert tries to stand up for Tino and explain that she did nothing wrong, but Liz doesn't want to hear it. So she kicks him into the wall and he's practically on the verge of death from that hit. Now that there are no more distractions, she gets back to yelling at Tino for being such an incompetent weakling. After all the training she has been put through. Tino starts begging for forgiveness, and Cry is finding this hard to watch since Liz is being really tough on Tino. While Liz is still yelling at Tino, the Phantom manages to recover from the kick it was hit with, and both Greg and Ruta have been pouring healing potions all over Gilbert to keep him from dying from the kick he was hit with. Cry doesn't want Tino to get hit with a kick as well, so he tries to calm Liz down and tells her that she shouldn't be mad at Tino. He sent her here to rescue some hunters, and she accomplished her mission, so it isn't fair to call her incompetent after how well she did. As soon as she hears Cry say this, all her anger vanishes as she asks Cry if Tino really did do a good job. Cry assures her that Tino really impressed him. And while he is on the topic of impressive people, Cry congratulates Liz on finally learning how to hold back with her attacks. Liz is really happy to receive praise, although she still doesn't see the point of making some of her attacks weaker, but since Cry was constantly insisting on it, she learned to stop her strikes short. Cry is glad she took his advice, but she might still need to work on it since Gilbert is in critical condition from her warning shot. Tino once again apologizes for all the trouble she caused, but Liz isn't mad about that anymore. She tells Tino that she has good talent, but she's going to have to work a lot harder to make up for her lack of strength. By now, the Phantom has regrouped with one of the wolf bosses and is preparing to attack the group again. But while everyone else is scared, Liz is just annoyed because the monster had the audacity to pull out a machine gun like it was going to do something. She picks up her mask, and as the wolf begins firing at her, she just stands there because the bullets are moving way too slow to actually be a threat. By the time the gun runs out of ammo, Liz is still standing there unharmed, and not only does she have some of the bullets in her hand, she even had time to create a pattern like this with the rest of the bullets she caught. She got over her anger before, but after learning that Tino was losing to a monster with a gun, she's even more mad than she was before. Liz was dodging bullets by the time she was 10 years old, so it is an insult to her strength for a monster to point a gun at her and think it will work. She is going to demonstrate how easy it is to take down a phantom like this, so she does a backflip into the air, and as she is coming down, she kicks straight through the giant wolf, splitting it in half and causing it to explode. That wasn't hard at all, so she doesn't understand why Tino didn't just do the same thing to defeat the wolf ages ago. 
While she was talking, the Phantom draws its sword and charges at Liz, but like with the first one, Liz thinks it should have been easy for Tino to defeat something as weak as this. After catching its sword with two fingers, she knees it into the air and proceeds to land punch after punch on it, all while berating Tino for being too weak to do this by herself. Tino breaks down in tears and Cray feels bad for her, but this is a pretty common occurrence with Liz as a trainer. Liz is the fastest hunter in the world and her incredible speed earned her the nickname of Stifled Shadow. Once everything is over, Tino, Greg, Ruta, and Gilbert all meet at the guild, and Gilbert informs them all that he wishes to give Cry his flame sword, because he has learnt that he was relying on it too much, so he intends to train his body from scratch until he is capable of catching bullets just like Liz. None of the others think he will ever be able to pull it off, but if he is serious about wanting to be like Liz, Tino thinks he should know something about the masks they wear. Everyone thinks Cry did this intentionally for the sake of homing his party's sense, but in reality, when he ordered the masks for the Grieving Souls six years ago, he forgot to have eye holes cut out, so everyone in the party basically fights blind all the time. Now that one crisis has been averted, remember the Shitori slime that Cry used as a distraction. It was created by one of Cray's childhood friends, Shitori Smart, who is the world's greatest alchemist. One of her elaborate experiments led to the creation of this slime, so she decided it would be safer to give it to Cry for safekeeping. At the time, Cry had no problem holding onto it since it looked like a harmless vial of slime, but when he tried opening it, Shitori warned him not to because that thing could destroy the capital if it was released. And as you know, Cry released it. He's still in denial and hopes the slime will magically appear back in his room, but he has no such luck. He decides to sit on his bed and think about this rationally. When he opened the vial back in the White Wolf's den, it didn't look like there was anything in there, and he has had the vial locked up in his safe ever since Shitori gave it to him. So the only conclusion is that the vial must have always been empty, so there's nothing to worry about. At least he hopes so. Meanwhile, back in the White Wolf den, an investigation team has been sent in by the association because there's something strange going on in there, and they have to get to the bottom of it. On Cray's end, he was so worried about the slime that he could barely get any sleep last night, and as he is walking through the halls, he happens to run into Ava, and she tells him that Gark wants him to give a detailed report on what happened in the White Wolf den. Cry really doesn't want to have to give a report, so he asks if Tino can do it instead since she was technically the team leader for that mission. Ava initially wanted to ask Tino as well, but she's busy training with Liz right now in the training and Ava isn't stupid, so she's not going anywhere there. On a separate note, Cry asks Ava if she has heard about any strange occurrence in the capital lately, but she has no idea what he's talking about since the capital has been pretty quiet lately. Cry says it's fine if nothing happened because he's actually hoping things stay calm, but now that he has brought it up, Ava says she will dedicate all her resources into investigating to find any anomalies. Cry tries to talk her out of it since he doesn't want her finding out that he lost Shitori's slime and to get out of the conversation. He says he wants to go check on Tino in the training hall. As he leaves, Ava thinks about all the time she has spent working with Cray, and despite his lazy attitude whenever it comes to natural disasters, treasure vault anomalies, or even politics, he has always been able to make accurate predictions with little to no information. At first, she thought it might just be a coincidence, but after he has been right so many times, she believes in him wholeheartedly. And if he is worried about something happening in the capital, then something serious must be going on. As Cry heads down to the training hall, he sees a bunch of hunters waiting outside, and once their leader notices him, he asks for help since none of them have been able to train at all today because of Liz's training. Sven asks him to find a way to get her to stop, but Liz is really scary when she's worked up, so Cray doesn't want to deal with her. Sten understands Cray's feelings because no one likes dealing with Liz in battle mode, but none of the other grievers are back yet, and if he tries to stop her himself, Liz may very well kill Sven, so Cray is the only option remaining. And if he doesn't stop Liz, Tino might actually end up dying because of her. Cray thinks Sven is just exaggerating because there's no way Liz would ever really kill Tino, but as he opens the door, he sees Tino laid out on the floor and Liz on the verge of killing her for being weak. She is angry that Tino is unable to move, so she raises her leg and is about to smash her skull in, but just before she does, Cry interrupts her. Liz is happy to see Cray, but she's kind of in the middle of something, so she asks him not to bother her. She thinks Tino has a lot of potential, but she keeps acting so weak and complaining about things like broken bones. Back when Liz was a kid, she used to be so much stronger than Tino is now, so she doesn't understand what's holding her back. Cry agrees that Liz was stronger than this at Tino's age, but Tino is clearly past her limit for now, so she suggests that Liz should cut today's practice short and give Tino a break. Liz gets up in Cray's face and asks if he's trying to stop her from training Tino, and Cray answers that he is, so Liz agrees and says she will leave Tino alone for now. 
But even though Liz is willing to let Tino go, Tino doesn't want to look weak in front of Cray, so she drags herself up and says she can keep going. At this point, there's nothing Cray can do to stop Liz anymore, so he just locks the door and tells Sven and the others that they aren't going to be able to use the training hall for today. Sven accepts that there's nothing he can do, but it's not all bad since Tino getting stronger would be a good thing. Since Cray is done here, he's about to leave, but before he does, Sven stops him and mentions that the northern route has been overrun with phantoms. A party from the Knight's Order was sent out to investigate, but the party was crushed in the process. Cry remembers hearing something about Traveler being attacked by phantoms near the White Wolf Den. And now that he thinks about it, there is definitely something off about it, which is probably why Gark wants to meet with him. But he doesn't want to have to work, so he wishes Ark were here to deal with it instead. Ark is smart, strong, and people trust him both as a leader and as a fighter, so Cry is sure he will be able to fix this once he gets back. But until then, Cry intends to stall for as much time as possible so he doesn't get assigned to the case. Stan sees the calm look on Cray's face and thinks he is already coming up with a plan to solve the problem, but in reality, Cray is just planning to send Sven to Gark in hopes that Gark assigns the mission to him instead. Cry casually suggests that Sven should head over to Gark's office and take on a mission since he can't train today, and he also wants Sven to tell Gark that Cry is too busy to attend a meeting with him. With that, he gets up and walks away, but Sven is having a hard time figuring out what Cry is thinking. His junior doesn't see what's so special about Cray, because to him, Cray looks like a leader who sits back and lets his subordinates do all the work for him. Sven says Cray has always been like that, but what's important is that he is always working behind the scenes to keep the clan running smoothly. He advises the junior not to underestimate Cray, because that man is a monster where he needs to be. Over in Gark's office, he has just received a report stating that the Lee lines near the White Wolf Den are unchanged, but that doesn't answer the question of what is causing all these incidents to occur. He wants to talk to Cry about this, but his assistant tells him that Cray is apparently too busy to meet with him, so Gark intends to pay Cry a personal visit later so he can't avoid the topic. He believes Cry knows something about the incident since he never willingly heads into vaults, but recently said he was heading to the vault to check out the situation there, so something big must be going on. Cry has no idea about any of this, but something big really is going on down in the vault. The Akashic Tower has been conducting experiments down here, but because of all the recent suspicion from the Association, they are worried that their operation will be discovered any day now. The device they created taps into the vast amount of power flowing in the ley lines and stores it here, creating modifications to the vault. If the Grand Wizard's theory is correct, then with this, you should be able to create treasure vaults at will. However, the research is still incomplete, so he cannot afford to lose his lab to the Association. His followers ask why Sophie Black isn't here since she's the one in charge of the defenses for this place, but the Grand Wizard says it's not her fault since he was the one who approved her vacation time. But he has already sent a message for her to return immediately, so she should be back soon. He is sure that once she arrives, she will resolve their trouble with the association snooping. But until then, the Grand Wizard says they all need to gather as much information as possible. Cry has a nightmare about a terrible catastrophe caused by Shitori's slime, and when he wakes up, he begins panicking again because he still doesn't know how dangerous that slime is. His panicking also happened to wake Liz up, and Cry is confused as to why she's here, but then again, she sneaks into bed with him all the time. So it's not out of character for her. Since they are both awake, Liz asks if Cry is busy today because she was hoping they can go out together, but Cry thought Liz had plans to train Tino today. Liz says she's giving Tino a break to heal from all her injuries, since neither of them has much to do today, Cry doesn't see the harm in going out on a date with Liz and it's a good opportunity to get his mind off the nightmare he just had. Meanwhile, Gard has just shown up looking for Cry, and the receptionist is surprised he personally came all this way, but he knows Cry will just keep avoiding him otherwise. Just then, Cry and Liz come downstairs, and Liz is pissed to see Gak here since she doesn't want anything ruining her date with Cry. Gark tries to be polite and asks her what happened to the Night Palace vault she was meant to give a report on, but Liz ignores his question and begins insulting him for always relying on Cry so much. Gark is starting to lose his patience, and when Liz throws a kick at him, that was the final straw, so he rolls up his sleeves and is ready to teach her a lesson. While that is going on, Cry doesn't want to be here, so he asks Gark's assistant if she wants to come upstairs with him. While he and Kana are having their chat, she debriefs him on the results of their reconnaissance, and Cray thinks it's good that the monolay lines are normal, but he's far more concerned about the other issue at hand. Kanan is confused and asks what Cray means by the other issue, however, Cray doesn't want to tell her that he released a slime that might destroy the country, so he tells her that the details are still confidential. He tells her he would like to go investigate it some more, but he is busy today, so maybe she should get Ark to do it. Mainly because Cray could never handle an actual mission on his own. 
Meanwhile, Gark and Liz are still going at it downstairs, and while Gark is a lot stronger than Liz, she's much faster than him so he hasn't been able to land a successful hit on her. She taunts Gark for letting himself get so out of shape with all his desk duty, but this only makes him matter, so he is ready to throw everything he has at her. Gark used to be known as a first-class level 7 hunter before he retired, and his strength is still worthy of that title. But Cry tells both Gark and Liz to quit fighting before they destroy this place. Gark is still pissed at Liz, but Lizzie immediately goes over to Cry and forgets all about her fight with Gark. Cry and Liz head out on their date, and as they walk, Liz remarks that Gark has really let himself go in recent years. Cry doesn't think it's fair to call him weak since Liz still gets to train often since she's on active duty, while Gark has to deal with all the paperwork now. Still, Liz says there's no way Gark would make it through the night parade vault in his current state, so Cry asks her if the monsters in that vault were really that strong. The rest of the Grievers are still in the Night Parade Vault, but Cry wishes they would get back here soon since he could use some help dealing with the slime situation. Just then, Liz hands Cry her bag and dashes off to tackle a dude in the middle of the street. Cry asks her what she's doing, so she explains that this guy was staring at them really suspiciously. Cry doesn't think that's a good enough reason to tackle a guy, so he tells her to let him go. He asks the guy if he's alright, but the guy just runs away and Cry has no idea why. Liz is confused and asks why Cry would let someone who was obviously up to no good escape, but then she realizes that Cry must have been intentionally ignoring him because he has a plan. So she apologizes for taking hasty action without asking him first. Meanwhile, the guy finds his way into a secluded shop, and he is a part of the Akashic Tower, but he doesn't understand how he got spotted, since he was following them at a safe distance. And the fact that Cry let him go after he was caught leads the man to assume Cry knows all about their operation. This was the end of episode 5. Subscribe to not miss the next part.